Hello everybody, welcome back to my channel and welcome back to the third and final part in the Ken and Barbie Killers Serial Killer series. At the time that I'm recording this, only the first part of the series has posted and you guys seem to really have enjoyed it and are really getting a lot out of it, so I'm really glad. At the end of this video, I'm going to just read a couple of comments from the comment section of part one because it gets really interesting and, and really funny at times and a couple of you guys said that you knew someone who knew Carla or who knew Paul, so just very interesting stuff and I really wanted to share that with everyone. This video today is brought to you by... Uh, this channel's merch. I'm just kidding. It's not sponsored. It's not a sponsored video, but my new merch line is coming out. I understand that there's a lot of stuff going on in the world right now, and when we designed and made these these shirts and everything, that obviously wasn't happening, but um, it's not going to be limited editions. So I'm not going to do that to you guys. It was meant to be a spring release, but I'm just going to put them up there, and you know, whenever you want to buy them, whenever you have the money or the time or the inclination, they will be there along with all of the other merch that we've released before. So nothing limited it's all on there even the Halloween stuff if you want to go check it out go check it out I'm wearing one of the shirts now that was designed for me by a incredibly talented incredibly talented subscriber of mine but because it was coming up on spring, I wanted to do something colorful. And I wanted to kind of do a throwback 90s concert tee because this is the picture she drew for me. Isn't it gorgeous? Oh my God, she's so talented. And I wanted to put this on a shirt and make it kind of like a Debbie Gibson or Madonna kind of really bright colors, shapes, you know, geometric shapes and colors and things like that. So that is what we ended up doing and here it is. So here is the shirt. And the cool thing about that design is it looks so good on, on all different colors of shirts because there's so many bright, beautiful colors in there. I love it. it. Brings me back to happier times. It makes me feel hopeful. It makes me feel like spring's coming, renewal, new life. So I love this. There's also Stephanie Harlow fingerprint shirts. The first one is very simple. It's just a white fingerprint and then it says allegedly in red over it. I have mine in light blue, I really like it. And then the next one is more colorful. So it's all different colors in the fingerprint. And if you look really close at the top in the orange layer, you can see allegedly and then Stephanie Harlow in the purple layer. This way you can represent the channel, but my name isn't just like boom, right there in your shirt and it can actually you know serve a different purpose. Like it could just be a fingerprint shirt if somebody was looking at it. And then the white fingerprint that says allegedly in the bottom right hand corner, right if you're looking at it, left if you're wearing it, but in the bottom right hand or left hand corner, it says Stephanie Harlow again in the fingerprint swirl. So they're a little bit more subtle if you want to support me, if you want to support the channel, if you like the designs, but you don't want my name just like completely scrawled across your chest so that people are like, who's that? Those would be perfect for you, but go and check them out. The link is in the description box. As of today, the campaign is live and you can go and purchase anytime and I'll keep renewing the campaign after so it's not limited edition so if you don't have the money now or if you just don't feel like making purchases now which I completely understand you can wait and do it whenever you're comfortable it'll be there for you I don't think I'm completely healed yet from the week-long sickness because um, I was like really cold and then I was really hot and now I'm cold again so it's just it's so much fun where did we leave off where did we leave off in the last video okay so when we left off in part two Carla Homoka had just left Paul Bernardo after he physically assaulted her and gave her two black eyes when he hit her with a flashlight. Paul's arrested, he's calling Carla over and over again, leaving her these sappy, desperate, thirsty voicemail messages threatening to, you know, end it all. And Carla Homoka thinks like, all right, I dodged a bullet, right? I got out of this relationship. We did all these horrible things together. Okay, check off the bucket list, but now I'm gonna move on and I'm gonna, you know, start my life over. Well, let's see how that goes for Carla. Okay, so let's dive back in. We're gonna start off with what's going on with the Green Ribbon Task Force and the Scarborough Task Force. And these two would finally come together in person when Sergeant Nesbitt went to Ottawa in January to take a two-week major crime scene techniques course at the Canadian Police College. Detective Irwin happened to be a keynote speaker during the course, and after he spoke, Nesbitt introduced himself. So remember, Nesbitt is with the Green Ribbon Task Force, and then um, Irwin is with the Scarborough Task Force. 
So they're both police officers, law enforcement officials, but they work on different task force and they, they haven't really cooperated a lot in the past. So Nesbitt asked Irwin if Paul Bernardo had been cleared yet and Irwin said he had not, but they had over 1,300 suspects, so that wasn't really out of the ordinary. It would take some time. Nesbitt requested access to the Scarborough files, but Irwin sort of brushed him off, saying the files weren't organized properly enough, so he didn't really feel comfortable lending them out to anyone at that moment. But this exchange did remind Steve Irwin that he needed to call the forensic scientist who he'd sent the samples to. So it seems like he had sent these um, samples over to the forensic lab and then sort of forgot about them, if you ask me, in my opinion. The forensic scientist's name was Kim Johnston, and when Irwin talked to her on January 23rd, she let him know that she still hadn't received the results from the five non-secretor samples that he had resubmitted almost three months prior. There were several reasons for this, according to Kim. One being that the lab was understaffed and Kim herself had been away taking a course to further her forensics training. Remember, this is at the beginning of DNA technology, so not many cities would have a forensic scientist or somebody who was trained in forensics and DNA. And if they did, it would be just one person. And this person would constantly want to be going to conferences and taking courses to further improve their knowledge on this new scientific breakthrough, essentially. Additionally, there was, as is always the case, a huge backlog, and homicides always take priority, so those samples would be run first. So essentially, a sexual assault is going to go at the back of the line because they have to run samples from murders and things like that before they get to the sexual assault samples, and I think this is absolutely ludicrous. I, I'm not sure if they still do this. I think they do. We talked about it in the video, um, the Cape Cod murder of Krista Worthington. It seems that that is how things are run. And there is always a backlog in these DNA labs, but they do handle these murders and things first. I think it should be done chronologically because if you don't get to a sample from a sexual assault right away, you run the risk of the person who perpetrated the crime going out and doing it to other people. And yes, I suppose you would run that risk for murders and things too, but if you do it chronologically, you should be able to keep up on the timeline of the criminals. That's just my thoughts, but let me know what you think. However, luckily, Kim Johnston called Irwin back on February 1st with some news. Paul Bernardo was the Scarborough rapist. Without a doubt, she had matched his DNA to DNA that was found on three of the victims. I mean, okay, this is great, right? We should arrest Paul immediately. Without a doubt, he is the one who spent years attacking women and girls in Scarborough, but they didn't arrest him. And there's a couple reasons for this. There's a couple reasons that have been speculated for why they, they didn't arrest him right away. The Green Ribbon Task Force wanted to keep him under surveillance. They wanted to watch him and basically catch him in the act because now they kind of had a good idea that the Scarborough rapist was the same person who had killed Kristen French and Leslie Mahaffey. When Carla was discharged from the hospital, she went to stay with her aunt and uncle in Brampton. She began writing down all the things that Paul had done to her in their time together. Even though she was terrified, allegedly, or pretending to be terrified, and she was hiding from her husband, she found ways to keep him in her life. She'd call his friends and complain about the hell he'd put her through, knowing that word would obviously get back to him. She wrote letters to all of her friends announcing her plans to divorce Paul. Carla liked attention, no matter how she got it. She loved getting the attention when she was the only one of her friends who'd bagged herself an older, handsome husband. She loved getting attention when she was throwing this lavish wedding. And she loved getting attention when she was making herself into a victim, regaling her friends with horror stories from her abusive marriage. She wrote to her friend, Debbie Purdy, I've left Paul for good, a true wife beater. I'm getting a divorce as soon as possible, yay. Write to me. I need to hear from friends. She also wrote to Debbie saying, He took five years of my life and I'm not allowing him to take any more. I'm really excited about my new life. I can't wait. And these letters are being sent out and she's saying these things in the weeks after being released from the hospital. Carla spent her days talking to her lawyer, Virginia Workman, getting her hair done, going out to dinner and to grab drinks, and going to see her doctor. 
telling her doctor that she was depressed. And this woman, Carla's doctor, noted that Carla didn't seem depressed at all. In fact, she seemed very positive, very upbeat and hopeful for the future. Carla spent her nights at the Sugar Shack, a nightclub of sorts in Brampton. It was kind of like a nightclub um, bar mix. She would always come in wearing a tight black dress, lots of makeup, on the prowl for someone else to take care of her, someone else to get her another diamond ring. Now, remember Christy Mann? Christy Mann was Carla's manager from the pet store she used to work at. Christy Mann was with Carla and Debbie Purdy when Carla met Paul. They were all kind of staying in the same hotel and sharing rooms. And Christy had always had this like bad feeling about Paul. So when Carla wrote her and said, you know, it's over, he was abusive, Christy felt really bad. So she came to visit to lift Carla's spirits and she discovered that Carla's spirits didn't need a lift at all. Carla was bubbly, happy, and she seemed to have completely gotten over five years of physical and mental abuse within the course of two weeks. Carla's plan for a whole new life without Paul would eventually happen, but it would be put on hold. On February 3rd, the Homokas received a call from a detective, Ron Whitefield. After the separate task forces had put two and two together, Paul had been put under 24-hour surveillance and a warrant had been filed to tap his phone. While they were doing all of this, they also found the assault charge from January 6th where he had attacked his wife with a flashlight. Now, Carla's sister Lori answered the phone and was told that her brother-in-law was a suspect in a criminal investigation and they needed to talk to Carla as soon as possible. Lori said Carla wasn't home, but Carla was home. She was sitting on the floor of her dead sister's room writing in her diary. Carla was living with her aunt, but she would obviously go back home to visit her sister and her parents, and when she did, she would take to just sitting in Tammy's room to write in her diary. The next day, Detective Whitefield and his partner, Detective Bruce Smolier, paid the Homokas a visit. While the detectives were there, Mr. and Mrs. Homoka said, listen, our daughter's hiding for her own safety, but we have encouraged her and told her that she needs to be brave. She needs to call the police and tell them her truth. And she did call the next day, telling the police she would be able to meet with them in person the following Tuesday. She was concerned that she was a suspect in something or that she was in some kind of trouble. And so, you know, she asked, am I in some kind of trouble? Am I being suspected of anything? And they assured her she was not in any trouble and they really appreciated her bravery and her strength in coming forward. Carla met with Detective Whitefield and we'll get to that in a moment. But that same night on February 5th, Carla went into the sugar shack with two other women, her Aunt Patty and her aunt's friend, Anne. This was the night she met another six-foot, sandy-haired man. His name was Jim Hutton, and he was a local salesman in his 20s. Apparently, he and Carla hit it right off, and they danced all night. And before she left, Carla told Jim she'd be back the next night. The next night, they met at the shack again, and this time, they went to another bar that was owned by a friend of Jim's. After this, they went to Jim's house and slept together. So Carla really didn't seem traumatized in the least, and she had no problem opening her heart and other things to another man, not even a month after her husband had attacked her and put her in the hospital. As Carla was living her best life, Paul Bernardo was spiraling to the point where even his friends were worried about him, and this says a lot because Paul's friends were mostly like him, narcissistic, self-involved. Not really wants to notice if anything's going on with someone else, more concerned on what's going on with them. Now, I don't know if Paul's negative outlook was all about losing Carla or if he felt law enforcement breathing down his neck. He must have known that his DNA would be connected to his Scarborough crimes at some point or another. He must have known he was living on borrowed time, especially now that he was estranged from Carla and he didn't have his support system and she was a wild card. As he was wallowing in grief, popping pills, and drinking too much alcohol, the task force was gathering to go over all their evidence. When Carla had met with Detective Whitefield, all they'd basically done was set up a time for her to be interviewed. And this was going to happen soon, so the task force wanted to make sure they had all their ducks in a row before they talked to her. Vince Bevan told the detectives that they would need to establish a timeline of Paul's movements for the time period of June 15th to the 29th of 1991 and April 16th to the 30th of 1992. These were the dates that coincided with the abductions and the murders of Leslie Mahaffey and Kristen French. 
Vince Bevan also wanted a detailed description of the jewelry worn by Paul Bernardo, mostly to match with the jewelry that the Scarborough rapist had been seen wearing, but also because Leslie and Kristen had been wearing jewelry that had never been recovered. The strange thing was, when Carla was photographed at the police station after her assault, she was wearing a leather-banded Mickey Mouse watch, very much like the one that Kristen's parents had given her. Bevan also wanted Carla's fingerprints. A map of Scarborough had been found in the parking lot that Kristen French had been taken from, and they obviously wanted to eliminate Carla as the person who had left those fingerprints. Carla was interviewed by police for five hours, during which time she realized that they'd connected Paul's activities in Scarborough to the murders in St. Catharines. Initially, she had gone in there thinking that they were just going to ask her about the Scarborough attacks, but when they asked her about her Mickey Mouse watch, she became visibly agitated. When the detectives asked why she'd become so nervous, she said it was because the watch was her sister Lori's and she'd borrowed it, and now they were going to take her sister's watch. When they asked for her fingerprints, Carla realized she had a choice at this point. Throw Paul under the bus or go down with him and Carla was not going to go down. She told the police she'd never really liked Paul, and he had forced her to marry him. She'd been abused and victimized, and now she just really wanted to move on. She basically was like, I'm done with this guy. Um, we are not connected. Don't look at him and attribute his qualities to me. I was a victim as well, and I'll give you whatever you need to nail him. When the police left, Carla made a calculated decision. And everything that Carla Homoka did was calculated, contrived. She confessed everything to her aunt and uncle, well, almost everything. She told them that she knew Paul was the Scarborough rapist, and she also knew he'd murdered Leslie and Kristen. They told her to call a lawyer. And Carla made an appointment to meet with a lawyer in Niagara Falls for the following Thursday. And then she called her new boyfriend, Jim. And the next night she went over to his house and they sat on the couch and watched TV and eat pizza and she stayed the night. After Carla met with a lawyer, she contacted the police, saying she'd be willing to testify against Paul in exchange for immunity. This lawyer, George Walker, had been practicing criminal law for 30 years, and he'd never really been truly shocked before, until Carla casually told him her story. And it was truly her story, a story in which she had been a powerless victim, manipulated and controlled by a psychopath who had forced her to witness and take part in horrible things. She told him about Leslie Mahaffey. She told him about Kristen French. And she told him about Tammy. The most odd part of this story is Carla had called the police, the same detectives that had interviewed her, and asked her for a ride to and from the lawyer's office. At this point, those around Carla were seeing her as a battered woman, a victim. How else would they really be expected to have seen her? Even those with the darkest of imaginations could not have come up with a story where this peppy blonde woman had eagerly helped her husband kidnap, rape, and murder innocent women. Carla's own doctor had been a victim of domestic abuse, so had her divorce lawyer. And when she was driving home with the detectives, the one female in the car, a detective by the name of Mary Metcalf, let Carla know that she had a lot of experience with child abuse cases. She told Carla that she knew victims of abuse would sometimes disassociate themselves from the situation in order to cope. All of this support for her, all of this aligning with her was telling Carla one thing. If she saw this victim act through till the end, she might just get away with murder. She had been given books about domestic violence and abuse from workers at the hospital, and her friend Christy Mann had even sent her a book on domestic abuse as well. This show of support was providing Carla with the research materials she needed. She had always been a voracious reader and an eager learner, remember? And she made it her mission to learn all about battered women. How did they act? How did they feel? she would become the victim that everyone already thought she was. Like an actor who researches a role, who learns a new accent, who learns a new language, who loses weight or puts on muscle, Carla researched and absorbed everything. Carla would go on to make what has been called a sweetheart deal with the Canadian police, and the big question has always been why. Why did law enforcement cooperate with Carla Homoka even though they most certainly knew she was not the innocent victim she pretended to be? 
Not only that, but this deal was made with incredible secrecy. No one was allowed to talk about it, including Carla. Hopefully we can get an answer to that question of why as we go forward. One thing that did encourage the deal to be made was an article which was scheduled to be published in the April 1993 issue of the Australian Family Physician. This article was titled Compliant Victims of the Sexual Sadist, and it was written by three different individuals. Roy Hazelwood, a clean-cut, deeply religious FBI special agent from Texas, Janet Warren, an associate professor at the Department of Behavioral Medicine and Psychiatry at the University of Virginia, and Dr. Park Dietz, a well-known forensic psychiatrist and an associate professor in the Department of Psychiatry at the University of California. Dr. Dietz and Hazelwood had interviewed 30 men who were considered sexual sadists, and during these interviews, they were able to also identify seven women who had participated in crimes committed by them. This theory placed Carla on the same level as her sister Tammy, on the same level as Kristen French and Leslie Mahaffey. Just as they had all gone along with what Paul wanted in order to survive, so had Carla. Bevan used this article, which was unpublished at the time, to justify the deal he would eventually make with Carla, even before anyone knew exactly what her involvement was, even when they were taking her story at face value, using her words as if they were facts. The desire to nail Paul Bernardo was so great that against their better judgment, despite logic and reason, the members of the task force needed to view Carla as the compliant victim, so they were able to sleep at night. They needed to see her that way, even though there was alarm bells going off in their heads constantly. And this is an example of cognitive dissonance, which occurs when a person holds two contradictory beliefs, ideas, or values, which leads to psychological discomfort. In an effort to ease this discomfort, people will believe whatever they need to believe to bring themselves back to a place of mental balance. Carla would go to jail, but in my opinion, her sentence would be a drop in the bucket of what she deserved, what she should have served. On Sunday, February 14th, Valentine's Day, the task force reported that Paul Bernardo had gone to Toronto to pick up a girl and brought her back to his house. So obviously, everyone's worried that she's another potential victim and they, you know, call it in, they send people over to the house, but she was just an ex-girlfriend of Paul's. And by the time they got everyone there to bust in and save her, she and Paul walked out perfectly fine and healthy and then he drove her home. And so they're watching Paul to sort of, you know, make sure he doesn't hurt anyone else, but they also kind of hope that he tries so they can catch him in the act. So they maybe don't need Carla's testimony or they maybe don't need Carla's help. That has never been reported, but I do think that they were smart enough, these people on the task force. I mean, they were well-seasoned police officers of Vince Bevan, although young and very um, blindsided to some things. He knew what he was doing. I think they said, if we can catch Paul doing this, if we can catch him in the act, maybe we won't need Carla's testimony as heavily, and maybe we don't have to make a deal with the devil. This same day, Carla's lawyer was working on Carla's deal, and the task force was keeping Paul under surveillance. Now, why hadn't Paul been arrested yet? The answer to that is Vince Bevan. He wanted to wait to arrest Paul, which was a very unpopular decision because he hadn't set Carla's deal in stone yet, and they had no other evidence besides her statement against Paul. Soon, though, he'd be forced to change his plan. On February 17th, detectives interviewed Paul and Carla's um, young friends, Jane and Norma. And in my opinion, the police acted completely unprofessionally. They wanted the girls to tell them about Paul, and in doing so, they basically let them know that Carla was working with the police and that they viewed her as a fellow victim, saying things like, we know Carla was an abused wife, and we wouldn't be surprised at anything she did under his influence, and here's why this is unprofessional and unethical. You've got two girls who are legitimate victims. And if you go in there and you start leading them with these questions or leading them with these statements, Carla's a victim. Carla's helping us. We're going to get Paul. You're making them feel, girls who have already been victimized, girls who have already been abused and probably do have lingering symptoms of distrust from this, you're making them feel like they cannot be honest with you. You might even be making them feel like maybe they're crazy, like maybe they thought Carla was a bad person. Maybe they thought Carla was helping Paul, but in reality, she was just another victim of his. 
These are young girls who have been through incredibly traumatic experiences. They're not going to feel comfortable coming forward and correcting a grown-ass police detective and saying, no, actually, you've got, you've got this all wrong. Carla is just as bad as Paul. What are you guys talking about? They're not going to do that. They're going to question themselves and they're going to keep quiet, which is the opposite of how you want to make a victim of abuse feel. This same day, the ball started moving very quickly on the matter of Paul Bernardo's arrest. Vince Bevan met with a reporter, a woman named Sue Scambati, and she told him very frankly, she had information they were keeping watch on a man who was suspected of being the Scarborough rapist. She said she knew kind of what he looked like. She knew where he lived because she was aware of where the police were surveilling. She wanted Vince Bevan to give her some more information, but he wasn't ready to do that yet, obviously, because it was an ongoing investigation. So this this woman, Sue Skimbadi, she was like, well, we're going to run with this story, whatever we have on the evening news. We got a story here. If you're not going to fill in the blanks, I'm just going to run with whatever I have, which is that I know you're keeping this guy who lives at this address under surveillance, under suspicion of being a rapist. And you guys haven't arrested him yet. So that same day, Bevan had to get his team together, the Green Ribbon Task Force, at 3 p.m. to tell them the arrest was happening, like, now. There was no time to wait. They had to get Paul under arrest before the evening news. At this time, the search warrant for 57 Bayview was incomplete, but they really didn't have much of a choice. The investigation had been compromised by the media, and they felt pretty comfortable and confident that since Paul lived alone, they could arrest him, put him in prison, and then in a couple days when the warrant came through, they could go in the house and they would be fine, it wouldn't be disturbed. It's not like anybody else lived there that would be hiding or compromising evidence. By 4 p.m., two law enforcement officials knocked on Paul's door. One was from the Green Ribbon Task Force, and one was from the Toronto Metropolitan in police. At this point, when they told Paul he was under arrest, he asked to call his lawyer and they said no. They said he could do that when he got to the station. There'd be plenty of time. But when Paul arrived at the Halton Regional Police Headquarters in Oakville at 442, he was not given the opportunity to make a phone call. Instead, they ushered him right into what is called a prop room, which is essentially a room staged to intimidate the suspect and lead them to believe that the police already know everything. So there's no point in denying it. There was a black filing cabinet with drawers labeled forensic exhibits A, B, and C. There was a large map of Scarborough with colored pins to signify where each attack happened. There was a big poster labeled Bernardo Homoka Family Tree and an assignment board that basically showed like which squad was on surveillance, which squad was on evidence recovery, etc. There were also photos that had been blown up of fingerprints. There was photos of Paul's camera and his car. And on a nearby table, they'd laid out gifts that Paul had given Norma. During the interview, they tried something called the 95-5 technique, which just basically means the police would talk 5% of the time and listen 95% of the time. And this is just good communication in a conversation, honestly. But they didn't really know who they were dealing with. Paul acted bored. He was picking lint off his pants, yawning periodically. And when it came time for him to answer a question, he simply said, no comment. When asked why, he kept saying no comment. He said, I'm just not in a conversational mood. And if you're going to do the 95-5 technique, the person has to be in a conversational mood. And you may need to talk more than 5% of the time in order to get them talking for 95% of the time, but these cops were thrown for a loop. Apparently, they had just learned this technique at some police conference class, and when they'd seen it happen on stage, you know, with the two police officers who were, like, role-playing, it seemed to work so great, but then they got in front of Paul, and they were like, this guy's not, he's not playing along. He's not cooperating. After four hours of this, Paul had still not been allowed to call a lawyer. And when Bevan questioned this decision, the Toronto police told him they did this all the time and it was perfectly legal. You didn't need to let a suspect call a lawyer when he asked. He had to first refuse to answer questions and then demand to call a lawyer. Eventually, after hours of asking questions that were getting no response, the police started talking to him about his music, rap music in general, crisscross. I think this was to get him talking, but really, it was just a waste of time because Paul would talk extensively about music and things, and he became very conversational, very excited, but as soon as the questions directed back to the investigation, he'd clam up. 
They played him the report of his arrest that had been on the news that night, and he said he didn't know how he was supposed to respond to it since everything that the report was saying was a lie. This report stated that Paul had been arrested and they were looking for a second suspect. At this point, the detectives who were questioning Paul hadn't told him that Carlo was cooperating with them. And when they asked him who is the second person, he wouldn't tell them, but eventually, when the police see that they are no longer in control of this interview, that Paul has run them around for hours with no plans to confess, they did tell him. One detective said, she's the best rat we ever had. It just happened to happen because your DNA matched in Scarborough and matched another profile from out here. Carla got found at the right time. In response to this, Paul yawned. I'm not sure if he was shocked that she'd turned on him. There was probably a part of him that was expecting it. But even though he was expecting it, he did not turn on her. He did not throw her under the bus. He didn't give the police her name. This could have also been contrived because I believe Paul Bernardo was just as manipulative as Carla Hamoka. So he may have seen that staged room, saw the things they had, the stuff from Norma, and figured out that they'd gotten to Carla. So he was trying to seem like the good guy by not giving her name. I'm not sure, but he did not give police Carla's name and he didn't really even say anything about her even after they let him know that she was the best rat they'd ever had. By 1.30 in the morning, Paul had been transferred to the East Detention Center in Scarborough and the next morning he appeared in court with a lawyer, but Paul was not the only Bernardo who had a court appearance that day. Kenneth Bernardo was also appearing in front of a judge to answer for the accusations his daughter had made against him, saying that Kenneth was assaulting her young daughter, Samantha. While all this was happening, Carla was trying to sink her hooks into her new man, Jim. She'd been spending time with him, and she confessed to him that she was going through a rough time, and there was bad things that had happened to her in her life. He didn't seem to care, which drew her closer to him, but the reason Jim didn't care was because he wasn't looking for a girlfriend, he wasn't looking for a wife. He was in his 20s, successful, tall, good looking, he wasn't looking to settle down. He just thought Carla was a fun, pretty girl to have fun with. But Carla had opened up to him, looking for another strong soul connection, like she thought she'd had with Paul. After Paul was arrested, Carla called Jim and gave him more details about what the bad things in her life had been. When she asked if Jim hated her, he said, no, you know, you're a victim too. The way you're telling me the story seems like you were a victim. Eventually, though, the media found Carla. And once the media finds you, the media are worse than the police, right? Because once they find you, you have no secrets. There's no privacy. There's no boundaries. They wrote about how she'd been involved, even if it was in an unknown way. And now she wanted immunity. At this point, Jim really stopped answering Carla's calls since this was no longer fun for him. And the dynamic between Carla and her parents reminds me a lot of the relationship between Casey Anthony and her parents. Carla seemed to be the dominant one in this situation in her household. Most likely from the time she could walk and talk, her parents had been deferring to her. And even though she lied, about everything, and she lied so often, at least publicly, her parents appeared to believe what she said or justify and excuse her behavior. After Paul's arrest, Norma had started to come over and spend time with Carla. Norma felt bad because the police had told her Carla was a victim just like her. But Norma had also told Dorothy Homoka everything, including that Paul had raped her while Carla was in the guest bedroom sleeping. But she made it very clear to Dorothy, like, I don't blame Carla because the police told me she's a battered wife and she couldn't have done anything about it. When Dorothy asked Carla about this, like, what the heck is going on? How could you not know this was happening? Carla told her mother, just forget it. Move on. This isn't important. These are small details that don't matter. Carla also told her mother that she'd be serving some time in prison, but when she got out, she was going to write a book about all of this and she would be rich. Now remember, Norma had been friends with Tammy Homoka before she died. They'd been the same age. She'd already been to the Homokas before, so Dorothy knew this girl for a long time. Same age as her deceased daughter had been to the house, had spent time with Tammy. And Carla told her, just forget about this little sexual assault thing where I was in the house and it seems like I probably knew, but just don't worry about it. I'm going to be really rich after I write a book. And Dorothy's like, oh, all right, that sounds cool to me. Nobody was supposed to know about this deal with Carla. Remember, it was supposed to be kept private, but of course, Carla was talking to friends, Dorothy was talking to her friends, 
And Dorothy's friends were concerned about her. They were like, oh my goodness, this is horrible. Your daughter was a victim. She was victimized. And now the police are making her go to prison? Nobody could understand why Carlo would have to serve prison time because the Homolkas hadn't told anyone how involved she'd been. Not even a hint of how involved she'd been. As far as anyone knew, Carlo was just, you know, somebody who was abused by Paul, who had married a husband, who had this secret life where he, you know, assaulted and murdered women and she didn't know about it. That's what they knew. So they couldn't understand why she was going to be serving time. And they were worried about Dorothy. They were like, oh my goodness, are you okay? And Dorothy said, oh, don't worry about it. I agree. Carla should take this deal and go to prison because when she gets out, she's going to be a billionaire after she writes a book about her experience with this. Everybody's going to want to know about it. This is going to be very, very popular. On top of this, in order for this deal to work, Carla would have to be arrested, put in, you know, the system, go to trial, all of that in order for the deal to go through. So she would be spending some time in prison until her trial. But the Hamokas combined spent a lot of money to keep Carla at home while her deal was being negotiated and while she was waiting for her trial. It was like the 1993 version of a GoFundMe. You know, they begged family and friends for money to keep Carla out of prison so they could pay her bail. They put their own house up as collateral. Do you think Carla's parents really believed she'd been a victim? Knowing their daughter their whole lives, hearing the inconsistencies in her stories, do you think they really thought she was completely innocent and only a victim? On February 19th, the search warrant was finally complete and a team of police and forensic agents descended upon 57 Bayview. Inside, they found numerous spots on the walls and floors that appeared to be blood, along with newspaper clippings about the missing and murdered girls. They also found test tubes with what appeared to be blue liquid in them. These test tubes were filled with crushed up halcyon mixed with a substance that Carla and Paul had crushed up and created together. This concoction that they could have on hand easily if they brought a girl home suddenly and they just needed to like dump this into her drink. Disgusting people, these two. Disgusting. In the bookshelf, they found titles such as Flowers in the Attic, Ritual Abuse, Bitter Blood, A Killing in the Family, The Anarchist Cookbook, The Confessions of Henry Lee Lucas, basically books that you'd think would be in the library of a psychopath or, I mean, every other true crime follower like me and you. According to research done by John Douglas, and we all know who John Douglas is, right? Mind Hunter. And his team, who had been studying sexual violence, 83% of men who were sexual sadists had these same kind of books in their homes. They also found the compendium of pharmaceuticals and specialties that Carla had hidden. Inside, the words halcyon and halothane were underlined and highlighted, and they found Carla's well-worn copy of American Psycho on her bedside table, perfect for some light, relaxed reading before bed. So remember, Carla had suggested that they hide the videotapes that chronicled their horrendous behavior and actions, and Paul had put them in the ceiling of the garage. The police did not find these tapes. However, they'd been told by Carla's lawyer that the couple had recorded some of their activities. When the team at the house found some videotapes, they were excited because they thought they'd found the videotapes. They did find two segments on a videotape that otherwise had recorded television show episodes on it. Aside from those two clips, everything else was like a TV show that had been recorded. And these videos featured Carla and Paul with two different women. The faces of these young women could not be seen, but one girl was clearly unconscious. And from her dark hair, the police felt that this must have been Kristen French. Carla is the star of this video, and she looks completely happy to be there and completely willing. You can't even hear Paul telling her what to do in the background. There's no demands. There's nobody else talking. It's just Carla in the video. And Carla does these things to these girls without any instructions. Vince Bevan looked at these recordings and realized he had a bit of a problem. The first girl was awake and willing, but the second girl was unconscious and certainly unaware of what was happening to her. And Carla didn't look like a victim at all. On February 25th, Carla's lawyer, George Walker, was still hammering out the details of her plea, which obviously had to be done before she went on trial and was sentenced. There was an agreement that Carla should serve 10 years per victim to be served concurrently. She'd be eligible for parole within three years and four months, and if she behaved herself, it was pretty much agreed that her parole request would not be denied. 
There was a secret meeting with the judge where the district attorney said it would be helpful if the Crown could write a letter to the parole board letting them know how instrumental Carla had been in getting Paul Bernardo behind bars. The plan was to have her arrested and formally charged, skip the preliminary hearing, and release Carla back to her parents while she waited trial. Once she was sentenced, they would try to get her sent to a mental health institution for her sentence, or at least for a part of her sentence. And this was contingent on one thing and one thing alone that Carla Homoka was 100% truthful with the police and lawyers. If she was caught in a lie, the deal was off the table. Or so they said. So the police and the forensics team, they're still at 57 Bayview. And technically, George Walker and Carla aren't really supposed to know what they're finding or what they're coming across or what they're doing. But of course, Walker, as a lawyer, a pretty um, high-profile lawyer, he has friends in the police department. He's got sources. And he, he gets a, an idea of what's happening. And Walker told Carla that the police had already been inside her house for five days. And they'd already found a videotape that cast doubt on her victim defense. And who knows what else they would find and how they would interpret what they found. The deal was good. It was the best she was going to get, and she needed to sign it without delay. So she did. Carla was afraid of going to prison, understandably, although I think she would, you know, be a boss bitch in prison. Like, she'd be one of those girls on Orange is the New Black who everybody's just, like, coming with gifts of cigarettes and bubble gum, taking a knee to the queen of cell block A. But Carla had never seen Orange is the New Black or Wentworth, so she didn't know how successful she could actually be in prison, and she was terrified. She didn't want to go. So when she heard that she could serve her sentence or part of her sentence in an institution, and that she would be able to essentially get off with serving 10 years for two murders, she was eager to get it done and put it all behind her. At this point, remember, no one knew what was going on with Carla. Due to the media, people knew she was involved, but it hadn't been made public what her involvement was exactly, or even that she would be going to trial and facing jail time. This was done purposely because the police and lawyers knew if it got out, there would be public outrage. Those who were close to Carla and her family, who'd been told that she was going to prison, they all walked away with the same question. Why would Carla be going to prison if she had nothing to do with it? If she'd done nothing wrong? No one knew exactly how involved she was. They'd only been told she was a victim, not a participant. The person working with Carla's lawyer to arrange her deal was a man named Murray Siegel, and he was the Ontario Deputy Attorney General. On February 26th, Bevan and Siegel met so that they could exchange information. Siegel said they were close to getting this deal done with Carla, for Carla. But Bevan had told him that the video lab technician had been able to find similarities between the unconscious girl in Carla's video and Kristen French. Bevan went to the families of the victims and he told them about Carla's deal. You know, we're thinking about making a deal with this girl. She's his wife. She knows everything. She can put him away for life. But he also told them that they'd done a great deal of research about compliant victims. And without a doubt, Carla was one. If they didn't give Carla this deal, they would have to hope to find evidence during their search of the house and take it to trial knowing it might not be enough. The families of Kristen and Leslie said they would do whatever the Crown's attorney felt was best and what was needed to win the case. But once again, this type of behavior on Vince Bevan's part was unethical and unresponsible. You're going to the families of victims who have been tortured, kidnapped, murdered by Paul and Carla. And you're not letting them decide for themselves, given the information about Carla and her involvement, whether or not she was an abused woman or a battered wife or a victim. You're telling them she 100% is a victim in this. She 100% suffered just as much as your daughters. And all we have to do is give her a little deal and we'll put the real person that you want behind bars. And honestly, I know that if I had been a parent of Leslie or Kristen and Vince Bevan told me that, and then I heard what really happened during trial, I would be furious. Furious, I would feel misled, I would feel lied to, and I would feel used, and I would feel like I hadn't had the appropriate opportunity to find justice for my child. With her prison sentence coming up, Carla herself was spiraling. She began drinking quite a bit, and when she was seen by her lawyer, he thought she needed mental help and that possibly she might even try to hurt herself. She went to see her doctor, who had admitted that Carla didn't look good, but she didn't get the impression that the young lady was suicidal. However, Carla was admitted to Northwest General in Toronto on March 4th, where she could have access to psychiatrists and be monitored. And she remained there for seven weeks, heavily drugged the entire time. The author of Invisible Darkness brought to my attention that while Carla was in the hospital, she played the role of a girl from a book she'd read, a book called Michelle Remembers. 
In the book, Michelle always carries a teddy bear, telling her psychiatrist, I loved the bear so much I wanted to become the bear. During Carla's stay, she carried her teddy bear Bunky around with her. She like never let it go. The same stuffed bear she'd given Leslie to hold while she and Paul tortured her. I wonder if Carla even knows who she really is when she's not playing a role. You know how when we were talking about the Michelle Carter and Conrad Roy case and that documentary about it, the one I didn't like, I think it was on Hulu or something, they said that Michelle was so obsessed with Glee and Leah Michelle on the show that she basically tried to play that part and she tried to make her life that. And I believe that that's exactly what Carla has done since the beginning. You know, the whole occult stuff and wearing black and wearing heavy makeup and having this like group of girls that runs the high school. This seems like a girl who's seen the craft way too many times and is just dying to be Feruza Balk. She imitated what she saw in her favorite movies or read in her favorite books. That was how Carla lived. Carla told her psychiatrist pretty ruthlessly that there was nothing she could have done for Leslie and Kristen. However, she was more concerned in kind of like prying her psychiatrist for information, trying to figure out what kind of evidence the police had against her. She mentioned to the psychiatrist that there was multiple videotapes, but she didn't know where they were. And she wondered out loud if the police had found them yet. So she's trying to get the psychiatrist to be like, yeah, I do think they found these videotapes actually, or to say, no, that they're not found yet. So she's trying to like figure out this information from the psychiatrist. She was also given several psychological tests, including the Minnesota Multiphasic Personality Test or MMPT. And her results were consistent with a deeply disturbed person who felt aggressive and hostile, but didn't know how to express these emotions. She was also given the thematic apperception test, which consists of being shown cards with pictures on them and then creating a story about these pictures. Her responses were considered unique, and they said she showed the personality of a deeply shallow person with poor integration at deeper levels. She was given all sorts of psychological tests, including inkblot tests, which really should never be used ever because they're all subjective, but she was given everything. And based on the results of these tests and based on what Carla said in therapy, they were like, oh, she's she's got PTSD. She has post-traumatic stress disorder. From her abuse, from what she witnessed, she is just completely depressed and traumatized. Before she left the hospital, Carla was encouraged to write her parents a letter coming clean about what had happened with Tammy. Here is what the letter said. Dear Mom, Dad, and Lori, this is the hardest letter I've ever had to write and you'll probably all hate me once you've read it. I've kept this inside myself for so long and I just can't lie to you anymore. Both Paul and I are responsible for Tammy's death. Paul was in love with her and wanted to have sex with her. He wanted me to help him. He wanted me to get sleeping pills from work to drug her with. He threatened me and physically and emotionally abused me when I refused. No words I can say can make you understand what he put me through. So stupidly, I agreed to do as he said. But something, maybe the combination of drugs and food that she ate that night, caused her to vomit. I tried so hard to save her. I'm so sorry but no words I can say can bring her back. I have thought many times of killing myself, but I couldn't put you through the pain of losing another daughter and sister again. I don't blame you all if you hate me. I hate myself. I live with the pain of knowing I unintentionally killed my baby sister every day. I think that's the real reason I put up with Paul's abusive behavior. I felt I deserved it for allowing him to drug and rape my beautiful baby sister. I loved her so much and I never wanted to do anything to hurt my Tammy skins. Please believe me. I would gladly give my life for hers. Nothing I can say or do could bring her back, and I don't expect you to ever forgive me, for I will never forgive myself. Carla. XO. XO. It is reported that when the Hamokas received this letter, Carl was devastated, but Dorothy just shrugged. She'd known from the start that there was more to the story of Tammy's death, and it hadn't changed anything. Carla hadn't killed Tammy, it had been an accident. Carla also told her therapist that she had a high tolerance for drugs, so she needed more, but she was given plenty of these drugs during her stay, and she said her tolerance for like the medication was so high because she'd been drunk almost every day she'd been married to Paul, which is absolutely 
Bullshit, guys. We know this isn't true. The doctor also had doubts about this statement, considering no one in Carla's life had mentioned her heavy drinking habit, and she'd never missed a day of work. Someone who's drinking that heavily day in, day out for five years, they're going to call in sometimes. They're going to be late sometimes. Their coworkers are going to notice that they smell like alcohol or their eyes are always bloodshot or they're out of it. And this doctor of Carla's at the hospital knew that Carla was sending this guy Jim letters and Polaroids, even though Jim wasn't really into it anymore which the psychiatrist felt was inconsistent behavior for someone who was experiencing post-traumatic stress disorder. And she was still a control freak over every aspect of her life at that hospital, almost as if she was strategically making sure that her notes and reports from her stay would reflect her intense emotional troubles. If she woke up at 4 a.m. from a bad dream, she'd have to go find the nurse and basically force them to make a note in her file that she'd woken up at 4 a.m. with a bad dream. So Carla's released from the the psychiatric hospital and afterwards Carla had to go to see her primary care physician and get like, you know, signed off. And in the notes from that day's visit, the doctor wrote that Carla had gained 15 pounds. She was on several really heavy medications. And in the notes, the doctor wrote, I'm not really sure why she was put on all these meds. I found her not to be depressed, but lacking emotion. The search of the house at 57 Bayview wrapped up on April 30th after 10 weeks of thoroughly searching it. The cement in the basement and garage had been jackhammered. The lawn had been dug up. Holes had been punched in the ceiling and walls. The carpets had all been pulled up. Oh, good lord. I bet the owners of that house weren't thinking about what great tenants Paul and Carla were now. In fact, the owners of that house actually were so upset and pissed off by how the police had just destroyed their house that had been completely renovated. They they demanded that they buy the house from them. The Crown started picking expert witnesses for the trial of Carla Homoka. Her psychiatrist at the hospital had stated that he believed once Tammy had died, Carla was stuck and she had to go along with what Paul wanted. Otherwise, he may have told everyone what she'd done and she didn't want her family to know and she didn't want Paul to hurt her or anyone else in retaliation for her lack of cooperation. Carla was officially diagnosed with PTSD, reactive depression, and something called alexthemia, which is a condition that is characterized by difficulty recognizing and verbalizing feelings, as well as a scarcity of fantasy life and speech and thoughts that are concrete and closely tied to external events. I've never heard about it before, but essentially it means um, you don't have an imagination imagination, you have a lack of a fantasy life, and almost like you're socially awkward, you know, so if you're talking to someone and they're annoyed by you, you can't tell that they're annoyed by you. You don't have good um, social cues. That's kind of what it seems to be. But I know there's people out there who are watching this who are actual mental health professionals, psychologists, psychiatrists, what have you, um, and then feel free to correct me or elaborate if I'm wrong in the comments. But now that Carla had told the psychiatrist at the hospital, Hospital, what happened with Tammy and wrote her parents a letter confessing that she'd been a part of it saying me and Paul were both responsible this didn't help Carla's deal. Murray Siegel told Walker that due to this new information, there would need to be extra time added to Carla's eventual sentence. George Walker was not so quick to just jump on whatever was offered to him. He'd been asking around and he knew the police had found nothing in the house. Nothing at least that could be used in a case against his client. In the end, two more years were added onto Carla's sentence for the death of Tammy. Two years for the life of her sister which she was being told she wouldn't even really have to serve because she'd be out on parole within four and a half years. There were no new charges added, and I think that's very important to note. Besides the fact that she was present and complicit during the assault of multiple young women, Carla Homoka was never charged with sexual assault of anyone. Now, Paul Bernardo was getting ready to go on trial and plead not guilty to the charges of first-degree murder, kidnapping, and aggravated sexual assault. He hired a lawyer named Ken Murray to represent him on May 6th. Murray went to 57 Bayview, the house that had already been searched by the police, to recover something that his client had instructed him to collect. Murray had gone to that house to get the videotapes that the police had somehow not discovered during their extensive search where they punched holes in walls and ceilings. They did not find 
those tapes. But even after Murray had them in his possession, it would be quite a while before those tapes would see the light of day. Paul wanted to use them as leverage. He knew what Carla was doing on those tapes. He thought that once they were seen, her deal would be rescinded. Even though he was pleading not guilty, I'm sure Paul Bernardo knew he was going down, but Carla was going to go down with him. I'm gonna try to play some clips from Carla's interview with the police where she gave her official statement. And if YouTube doesn't let me put them in because of copyright or whatever, I'm gonna put links in the description box. And what I want you to do is pause this video, go and watch her interview. I think there's two different clips. They're only about three or four minutes each. Go and watch her interview and what she says and then come back so we can discuss it. But hopefully YouTube just lets me put in the clips. And the reason I want you to really hear her voice saying these things, hear her own words instead of just telling you what she said, is because hearing the things she says to the police in her voice, in her manner, it's even more surprising that they went forward full throttle with the deal after hearing this. In this statement, she talks about Leslie and Kristen. When she talks about Leslie, she tells the story of how upset she was when she saw that Paul was drinking champagne with Leslie out of their wedding flutes. Oh, and I was really mad too because um, when I took Buddy out, there were two champagne glasses on the dining room table. And we had these really expensive champagne glasses from France, which we never used. He had those out. The two of them had been drinking champagne from those glasses. And I was really mad. Carla also said that Paul strangled Leslie with an electrical cord and they thought she was dead, but then Leslie took a breath and this freaked Carla out. And uh, then she took a breath. And that freaked me out even more. I w he should have slapped me in the face because I was really hysterical then. So he went over to her and he did the same thing. He strangled her more. And I think I watched that time what the hell she's dead anyway like she claims paul went over and strangled leslie more and this time carla did watch thinking what the hell she's dead anyway obviously she's not dead carla because he had just said she took a breath when carla talked about Kristen french she recalled how they had planned it together Paul had asked her what they were going to do and Carla said they were going to go find a girl and she was going to pretend that she was lost and ask for directions so Paul could grab the girl. Well, if we see a girl, we're going to stop. I'm going to, I'm going to ask her for directions. I'm going to try and get her over to the car. So he wanted her right beside him so he could hold the knife to her. And I sat in the back seat, actually more in the middle of the two of the front seats. And I held her hair and like I held her head down. She then says... I never should have gotten to know Kristen because you get emotionally involved with these people and it really hurts. It hurts a lot more because I felt like I was friends with both of them, especially Kristen, because we did so much stuff together. We put makeup on together, we talked, you know, just girl talk while Paul was gone getting food. It just made it hurt even more. I never should have gotten to know Kristen because you get emotionally involved with these people and it really hurts. It hurts a lot more because I felt like I was friends with both of them, especially Kristen, because we did so much stuff together. We put makeup on together. Um, we talked, you know, just girl talking Paul was, when Paul was gone getting us food. And it just made it hurt even more. So she refers to her victims as these people, which is distancing language. But then she claims to have gotten close to both of them, especially Kristen she contradicts her own self as she's talking. But then she talks about what happened before Kristen died, when she told Paul that they had to go to her parents for Easter dinner, and he said he didn't want to leave Kristen alone in the house. Paul said, let's just skip dinner. But Carla told him it wouldn't look good because if they didn't go, they'd have no alibi. I said, well, we have to go to my parents for, for Easter dinner. And he said, well, why don't we just not go and I said well I don't think it would look very good I mean we're supposed to go to my parents for Easter dinner and we don't go and I said well how's it gonna look if um you know this girl's missing and we have no alibi we haven't gone anywhere we haven't done anything and uh, he said well I guess you're right and because he wanted to keep her for longer and I didn't want to like I was going to work I didn't want to go to work knowing that this girl was in my house and she could escape so easily and I didn't I was afraid, so so I didn't suggest to him that we kill her on Sunday, but I knew that she, I knew that she had to be gone. 
And Carla says, quote, he wanted to keep her for longer and I didn't want to. I was going to work. I didn't want to go to work knowing this girl was in my house and she could escape so easily. And I didn't, I was afraid. So I didn't suggest to him that we kill her on Sunday, but I knew that she, I knew that she had to be gone. And this is how she says it, like completely unaware of the fact that what she's saying is wrong. And I think she does become aware at one point where she says, I didn't want to go to work knowing this girl was in my house, distancing language again, this girl was in my house and she could escape so easily. And I didn't, and then she pauses and she's like, I was afraid, you know, go to the victim role. I was afraid I was a victim. So I didn't suggest to him that we kill her on Sunday, but I knew that she, once again, she pauses. She's like, okay, I'm, I'm walking myself into a trap here. I knew that she had to be gone. First of all, Paul wants to keep her alive, Kristen, for longer. So he's like, let's skip dinner. We can, you know, stay here with her. And Carla says, no, that's not good. Then we won't have an alibi. She's acting like a victim, but she's the one telling Paul that they need an alibi for Kristen's disappearance. She basically convinces him that they have to kill Kristen because otherwise they can't go to Sunday Easter dinner at her parents and they won't have an alibi. She is the one who suggests that Kristen is now a problem. Kristen is now a presence in their house that they can't leave there. What she says, the way she says it, it says everything to me. Carla was the one who basically told Paul, Kristen's a liability. She's got to go. We have to go to my parents for dinner because Carla hated the fact that it was time to go to her parents' house for Easter dinner and Paul wanted to stay home with Kristen. She was resentful and jealous of Kristen. She was resentful and jealous of anybody who took Paul's attention away from her. What kind of victim helps her husband kidnap a girl, helps her husband keep this girl hostage and abuse her, and then tells her husband, listen, we gotta go to dinner and we have to get rid of her because we need an alibi. And we obviously can't keep her here forever. <laughs> she's gotta go at some point. And you can tell she's clearly thinking about what she's saying. She's pausing to rephrase because she sounds like an absolute psychopath. She sounds like a monster. Even with all the thoughts and pauses, she still sounds like a monster when she's purposely trying not to. She admits that it was her idea to call the drugstore and tell them she needed the halothene for clinic use. Therefore, she wouldn't have to give um, a consumer name or her name. She would just have to give a doctor's name. When she's questioned about the burns on Tammy's face and how they were chemical in nature, Carla said the only chemical that was near Tammy's face was the halothane and that Carla had never placed it directly on her face. She had held it and she uses her hand to show them like this far away about, you know, from her face, which is an absolute lie. This was my idea, not his, was to call um, the drugstore and tell them that I needed it for clinic use. The reason I told them for clinic use was because that way I didn't have to give a name. All I had to do was give a doctor's name. Those burns are possibly chemical in nature and anti-mortem. The only chemical that was near her was the halothane. It was not placed on her face directly. It was held, as I said, like this, this far away. It's an absolute lie. Carla put that chemical directly on her sister's face over her mouth and knows, but the videotapes haven't been found yet. And she knows they haven't been found yet, so she knows they won't be able to prove that she's lying. She's banking on these videotapes never being found. And I mean, like, I know it's a lie. You guys know it's a lie. We know because of hindsight. However, the burns on Tammy's face should have been evidence enough to the police that it was a lie, because what else would have made those burns? The police even brought Carla through her old house so she could show them where everything happened and recreate the murders of the two girls. While there, Carla acts like this is just business as usual. First of all, she came wearing a, a button-up white blouse and a plaid skirt. She dressed like a schoolgirl. And she's questioning the police on, you know, if any furniture has been damaged during this investigation. Right after she finished reliving what happened to Leslie. Can you answer a question for me? Was any of the furniture damaged as a result of the investigation? Not that I'm aware of, no. Okay, good, so I'm asking for in the bathroom, she's upset because she finds out that Paul's lawyer came and took her things, including her perfume. I don't have any of that stuff. So where are all those articles now? Where Paul's lawyer took them. You're saying Paul's lawyer took a number of articles from Well, from what I understand, his lawyer took basically everything. 
And in the basement, she, this is where we carry the down, carry down the she asks if she can have this rug because her sister Lori wants it. It's absolutely ridiculous. Can I ask you a question? Can I I'm have, afraid I can't can ask I you. Can I have that rug? My sister wants it. Um, Why does that have to stay here? That has to stay here for okay. now, but we can make those arrangements. Okay, thank you. And my Christmas tree. And at one point, she keeps saying, like, can I ask you a question? Can I ask you a question? And the last time when she's asking about the rug for Lori, the police officer's like, yo, let's stop asking questions. Like, you're here to help us figure out how you and your husband killed these girls, not ask questions about perfume and rugs and damage to furniture. You're going to prison. Something that the interviewers noticed about Carla that other people would notice later during Paul Bernardo's trial is how resilient she was through hours and hours and hours of questioning over three days, especially when the subject matter was horrifying. They would take these frequent breaks, but one time she was like, listen, we don't need to take all these breaks. Like, I don't know if you're taking the breaks for me because you think I need them or if you're taking them for you, but if you're taking them for me, don't worry, we don't need breaks. I can keep going. Being the center of attention, having an audience on the edge of their seat while she told her stories, Carla loved that. When she said something extra shocking or horrific and they reacted, she'd be bolstered. They said the more difficult and trying her circumstances were, the stronger she became. Paul Bernardo was charged formally on May 18, 1993. At the end of that month, Carla wrote her friend a letter about how intrusive the press had become and how much the people in St. Catharines hated her. It was so unjust. She told this friend, I really need a single girlfriend to go out and meet men with. She also wrote to her old friend Christy Mann to talk about the benefits of being in jail. She was going to get her college degree so that she could be a social worker when she got out. A lot of positive things had come out of this whole situation, including the fact that she was not being charged with manslaughter and she'd eventually be able to walk free, while Paul never would. Her trial began on June 29, 1993. There was a publication ban put on her trial preventing the media from reporting on it. Paul's lawyer, Ken Murray, was infuriated by the whole thing. Not only had he gone through the evidence of the case, but he'd seen and made copies of those videotapes. Apart from Carla and Paul, he was the only person alive who had seen the things on those tapes and it traumatized him. He wasn't trying to say that Paul Bernardo was innocent, but he knew for a fact Carla was not a victim. Murray believed that the publication ban was put into place to protect Carla and he told the press that the Crown had made a deal with the devil. How would Paul get a fair trial when half the story was being hidden? He tried to contest the publication ban and get it lifted so that everyone would know everything that Carla had said in private to the police, but he was unable to get that ban lifted. Paul's father, Kenneth Bernardo, served two months of a nine-month sentence and was released after his daughter, Debbie, wrote a letter to the court saying she had forgiven him and that he had paid his debt to society. When he got out, he began drumming up interest in a book he was writing about raising the most notorious sex criminal that Canada had ever known. I wanna talk about this a little bit more at the end of the video, but you can clearly see that it's not only Paul who seems to be a little unstable. Debbie, although I feel terrible for her that she was the victim of an abuse, also seems to have this strange connection and dynamic with her victimizer. This man molested her and her daughter, her four-year-old daughter, she was brave enough to press charges to stop it. But then at the end of the day, she's thinking, he's still my father, you know, he's not gonna do this again. There's that whole kind of Stockholm Syndrome thing going on there. The weekend before Carla went to prison, her mother went there to decorate Carla's cell with her favorite sheets and a, you know, a nice color TV. Then she went home and threw her daughter a going away pool party. It was reported to have started in the afternoon and lasted all night. Reporters crowded around outside the property line to see if they could catch some pictures of Carla and one snapped a photo of her sunbathing topless earlier that day. But once the guests arrived, they shielded her from the paparazzi with a large piece of cardboard. I'm sure she was loving the attention. A guest at the party claimed that Mrs. Homolka, Dorothy, drank too much and laughed about how she hoped the trial would be quick because she was spending a lot of money to buy Lori and Carla new clothes for court. It was also reported that one of the guests remarked, oh, what the heck, the girls are dead. You can't bring them back. Why not party? Birds of a feather flock together. You know what I mean? The company you keep is very indicative of what kind of person you are. 
The judge presiding over Carla's trial was named Francis Kovacs, and he made a decision that outraged a lot of people, including the media and the general public. Everyone knew about the murders. Everyone knew about Paul and Carla. And just like today, when we follow a case, we know when they go to trial, we'll learn more and we'll be able to fill in all those empty pieces of evidence we've been wondering about for months. But when Carla went to trial, Judge Kovacs issued a time-limited ban on publication of the details until the completion of Paul's trial, which wasn't scheduled to happen until 19. 1995. So Carla's trial was happening in 1993. Imagine if you're following the Gannon Stout case and T. Stout goes to trial and they tell you that you can't know what happened in that trial for two years. That would be crazy. It would make us want to know even more. It would make us wonder what was being hidden and who was being protected. They claimed it was so that Paul Bernardo could get a fair trial, but in reality, most likely had more to do with the ridiculous deal that Carla was receiving, especially for those of us who live in the U.S. A publication ban on trials never really happens. Like I could, I cannot remember the last time it would have happened. U.S. media was not even allowed in that courtroom, and Canadian publications were allowed, but they were forbidden from printing anything they heard until after Paul's trial. However, we all know nothing stops the presses. Papers get printed every day, and they have to be filled with something. The publication ban only made things worse in my opinion because now papers were printing rumors, things they were able to get from sources, speculation. Without reliable facts and evidence, they were putting information out there that wasn't all true or legitimate, which only fueled the fire of interest that was blazing around Carla and Paul. When the press that was present during the trial heard what Carla had done to her sister, to Kristen French and Leslie Mahaffey, when they realized that it had been within her power to save all three of these girls, and that she'd taken a much more active role in the crimes than anyone had previously known. They were frustrated, understandably. They'd been trying to figure out what was going on in this case for months. Now that they knew, they couldn't tell anyone. And people really should know what Carla Homolka was doing, what she was up to, that she was no victim. But it didn't really matter what the media thought or even what the judge thought. The deal had already been ironed out, signed, and agreed on by Carla's lawyers and the Crown's lawyers. It was over. She was sentenced to 12 years imprisonment, and she later wrote to her friend Christy Mann, I'm eligible for full parole in four years. Not bad. Court on Tuesday was absolute hell. That judge really hated me big time. We all hate you big time. All of us. She was sent to the Kingston Prison for Women in Kingston, Ontario to await Paul's trial where she would testify. On July 20th, 1993, Tammy Homolka's body was exhumed and sent to the Forensic Pathology Unit at the Toronto Morgue. Inside Tammy's coffin with her was a little teddy bear, a picture of her parents, and a bunch of Paul and Carla memorabilia for some reason. It was like opening a time capsule from a year where Paul and Carla were madly in love instead of at each other's throats. There was pictures of Paul and Carla, a book of matches with their names on it that was supposed to be given out at the wedding, a wedding invitation, a napkin with their initials on it from the wedding. Absolutely ridiculous. The fact that Carla either put those things in there or provided these things to be put in there after knowing what she did to her sister, it's so, so twisted. It just keeps getting worse. Even though it had been two and a half years and Tammy's body was decomposing, the large burn on her face could still clearly be seen. While her sister's body was being combed for forensic evidence, Carla sat in the hospital unit of the prison to be assessed before being assigned to a prison cell. Her first official night behind bars was August 3rd, almost a full month after her arrival at Kingston. And from the letters going out of the prison to friends and family, it seems that not all of the people from her life on the outside were being as supportive as she would have liked. She sent a letter to Christy Mann on September 5th, which was basically a gaslighting guilt trip on paper. She said, quote, I'm really sorry to hear that you feel the way you do. I can't and won't try to justify anything to you. I was under the impression that friends were friends no matter what. A friend is one who knows everything about you and loves you just the same. Thank God almost all the people I call friends are truly my friends. I'm very disappointed, Christy, but I'm not about to try and change your mind. And don't bother trying to defend my actions. It's not your place to do that. That's my family's position and people who really care about me. Christy, your letter hurt me deeply. I just want you to know that. And also, if you can't accept things now, wait till Paul goes to trial and the publication ban is lifted. Then you will really hate me. So I guess it's better for both of us that things happened now instead of later. You will never understand what he did to me and no amount of explanation will make you understand. And you know what really amazes me? I get letters every day from strangers telling me that they understood I was dragged into this and that I am a victim too. The police think I'm a victim. One person even told me he thought I was more of a victim than Kristen and Leslie are. 
and one of my friends turns against me? Ugh. Carla is the person who will literally get drunk, crash your own car into your own mailbox, and then wonder why you're upset. She's the one who will poison your dog and apologize once and then get agitated when you don't forgive her right away. If you don't benefit her, if you don't support or encourage her victim narrative, she has no use for you. On October 26, 1993, the television program A Current Affair did an episode on Paul and Carla, and they were surprised to find how many cooperative parties they discovered who were willing to give them information and even videos and photos. Carla's own uncle sold them footage from their wedding. Paul's friend Van was willing to talk to, and the family of Leslie also was very willing to share their feelings and what they knew. They had more footage than they could even use for the program. So, you know, Carla's just hanging out in prison, writing letters, remembering more things that Paul did to her that she'd forgotten, talking to her psychiatrist, asking the two policemen who'd been assigned to keep an eye on her if she could get a visit from her dog. The focus shifted from Carla to Paul. It was time for both sides to prepare for his upcoming trial. On November 22nd, Paul's lawyer Ken Murray met with members of the Green Ribbon Task Force to go over evidence that would be presented at trial. They also toured a plexiglass model of Carla and Paul's house that had been built. Murray was building his case. Not that his client was a good person or an innocent person, but that Carla was just as guilty and evil. The prosecution was obviously specifically focused on Paul, and they were interested in his audio tapes that he routinely made, most of which was just like his rambling thoughts, song ideas, lyrics ideas, rap lyrics. They were very interested in the lyrics to his title track, Deadly Innocence. They believed that in this song, Paul was revealing his true personality. He knew he looked like a young, handsome, dimpled kid, and this was what had allowed him to continue with his nefarious actions for so long. They would later want to bring this up during the trial, but they were not allowed to since creative writings like song lyrics, poems, um, short stories, you know, fictional short stories, they can't be used as evidence to attest to the person's state of mind or beliefs since they're fictional. At least it was believed that these things couldn't be a reliable source of a person's true intentions or beliefs. But those videotapes that Paul had directed Ken Murray to pick up, they hadn't been seen by anyone but Ken yet, right? And this was an issue in its own way. He wanted to spend time with them to be able to put together a timeline mostly to show that Carla could and would be a repeat offender. She'd been responsible for dosing her sister with Halcyon and Halothane to the point where she died. But six months later, she'd done the exact same thing to Jane who had also stopped breathing, and clearly she hadn't learned her lesson. Clearly, she didn't value human life at all. Murray thought it was insane that the police were still willing to make a deal with Carla after seeing that little clip that they'd discovered where she was clearly and cheerfully taking part in something against a woman's will. He thought it was insane that when the fingerprints from that map that had been found in the parking lot where Kristen French was abducted, a map of Scarborough, had been tested, they had Carla's fingerprints on them. So the police knew Carla had been there when Kristen was abducted. He thought it was crazy that they knew all of this stuff about Carla, but they were still willing to give her a deal. He withheld the videotapes because he wanted to have a clear understanding of what was going on before the prosecution got their hands on the tapes because then, you know, he didn't know what was going to happen to them, how they would be used or if they would even be used at all. Now remember, I told you about that woman who Paul had attacked in a parking garage right before Christmas of 1989. Her name was Deneen, and in December of 1993, she filled a $10 million lawsuit against Paul, claiming that his wife Carla had aided and abetted him during her attack. If you remember when I told you that this woman was attacked in a parking garage right before Christmas, and she told police she'd seen a blonde woman in that garage with a video camera, but they hadn't believed her at the time. I believe that Carla was in that parking garage with Paul when he attacked this woman. I believe that this woman saw a blonde woman with a camera. It makes sense. And she said this long before Carla and Paul came out into the public eye and people knew they liked to record things. It's never been proven. Nobody really has tried to, I guess. But when Carla found out about the lawsuit, she didn't deny being there or being a part of it. She just laughed and wondered what this woman thought she was gonna get from us. We're broke. So the police have this small clip, right, of Carla 
and this unknown girl, which they thought was Kristen French, but then they discovered it wasn't Kristen French. In fact, it was Jane. And they question Carla about this, but they don't say we saw this on a video. They just question her about her and Paul's relationship with Jane. And Carla's like, yeah, we know Jane. But she said that it was Paul who sought Jane out. It was Paul who convinced and told Carla to drug her with Halcyon and Halothane. And she said it was Paul only who sexually assaulted Jane while she was passed out. This proves that she lies about everything. So she thought lying was going to be okay or she'd get away with it. But this is very visible proof that although she's willing to talk at length and she loves the attention, she's always going to tell a story that puts herself in a secondary role. The controlled, the victimized, the manipulated, the unwilling cohort to a madman. And even though she lied, even though she'd been caught in this lie and others, her deal was not taken off the table. It wasn't removed. She wasn't told, tough luck, you lied, and you weren't supposed to do that, so we're not going to help you anymore. And the police hadn't given the information about Jane to the defense lawyers yet or to the prosecution because they didn't have a concrete timeline yet. They'd figured out that the assault on Jane had happened on June 6th or June 7th, but the 911 call that Carla had made about Jane not breathing had not been made until August. So they were confused about this timeline. So they thought maybe we did something wrong, maybe our calculations are off, we have to keep working on this timeline, but Ken Murray, who'd been watching the videotapes, the real videotapes, the full videotapes, he was putting the puzzle together because he had basically everything almost in chronological order. And he'd seen the video of Jane that was dated August 11th. So he was aware that the video of Carla and Jane had been made on Jane's first trip to the Bernardo house. And the August visit was when Jane had stopped breathing from the Halcyon and the Halothane. And since Carla was to be a witness at Paul's trial, Murray, who was Paul's lawyer, was able to question her beforehand. She answered his questions, not knowing he was in possession of the tapes. She swore up and down she'd never used halothane on anyone else but her sister. Murray knew that she was lying, but he couldn't say how he knew that she was lying, and it was frustrating for him, so he knew it was, it was really time to do something about it. On August 15th, Murray met with respected criminal attorney John Rosen at his Toronto offices. John Rosen was a well-known lawyer, well-known for getting his clients off or at least getting their sentences greatly reduced. Ken Murray didn't feel that he could be Paul's lawyer any longer, and he wanted Rosen to take over the case. Murray was in over his head. There was too much to this case. He was working day and night nonstop. And Rosen put in his due diligence to get to the bottom of what was really going on, the real reason Murray didn't want to be on the case anymore. He spoke to Murray Murray's co-counsel, a woman named Carolyn McDonald, and she told Rosen, Murray's been impossible to work with and I don't want to be on this case any longer if he's going to continue working on it. She said that there was something really strange going on and she couldn't put her finger on it, but it was clear to her that Murray knew something she didn't. She could tell when he questioned Carla that he had information he hadn't shared with Carolyn. And she wasn't sure how she was supposed to keep working on a case with a co-counsel who wasn't being completely honest and upfront with her. Whatever Murray had though, it was big, but she didn't know what he planned to do with it. Rosen asked his partner, his law firm partner and his family, you know, what do you think if I took this case? And they all told him they absolutely did not want him involved with this case. But John Rosen was intrigued and he wanted to know what Murray knew that he hadn't shared yet, so he took the case anyway. Rosen and Murray together went to the Niagara Regional Detention Center at the end of August to talk to Paul, but before they both went in to talk to him, Murray wanted 15 minutes alone with his client before he allowed Rosen in, since Paul didn't know Murray would no longer be his lawyer and he wanted to break it to him privately. But still, Murray did not tell Rosen about the videotapes. Rosen only figured out that something was up when he got a call from another lawyer, Austin Cooper, who informed Rosen that Ken Murray had called him requesting Cooper to represent him. Rosen was confused as to why Murray would need a lawyer. Cooper told Rosen it was an ethical issue. Murray and his new lawyer, Cooper, went to talk to Paul in prison, and then Paul spoke with Rosen on the phone and requested to see him. They needed to have a conversation, but not on the phone or in the presence of prison guards. Once Rosen was fully read in, the tapes were turned over to him, eight tapes in total, as well as copies that Ken Murray had made. When Rosen viewed the videotapes, what he saw horrified 
and emotionally moved him so much, he had to get up and go to the bathroom to cry. When Vince Bevan found out about the tapes, he quickly launched into damage control mode. This deal wasn't his fault, because if Murray had turned the tapes over when he'd found them in May, as he should have, the deal never would have gone ahead. The Green Ribbon Task Force viewed the tapes one after another in chronological order. They saw footage of Paul stalking women and recording them without their knowledge. On that same tape, Leslie and Kristen's attacks were found and shown. The second tape was Tammy's tape followed by Jane's attack. The task force recoiled as they were able to clearly see and hear Carla using halothane on Jane even after she was passed out. Understandably, they were horrified. Some of these task force members had worked closely with Carla, believed her, felt badly for her, and here she was right in front of them, having the time of her life. They also saw footage of Carla after Tammy's death impersonating her little sister in a sexual way with Paul. Using these videos, a 10-minute reel was created to be played during Paul's trial. Of course, when George Walker, Carla's lawyer, found out what was on the tapes, he was shocked. He'd suspected there was more to his client than met the eye, but no one could have predicted this. Walker met with Carla and told her, look, this is bad. Jane is a new victim. She doesn't count under the deal. If they decide to pursue this and charge you, you could get life in prison. Carla had told him she'd just forgotten about these things due to memory loss from trauma. She'd blocked them out. He said, okay, that's fine. I mean, I believe you. But if the police and the prosecution don't buy that, everything that happened in the past, your deal, your reduced sentence, it doesn't matter. As easily as it was given, it could be taken away. And this is 100% true. The new information about Jane should have been caused to bring new charges against Carla. But there would be no new charges. There would be no retraction of the deal because that would reflect badly on the Crown. They would have to admit that they'd made a bad call and colluded with a monster. There was a lot of back and forth between Carla and her lawyer, the police, and the prosecution team that was going to be handling Paul's trial, but we really don't have time to go into all of it or we'd need a fourth part and we can't do that. What can really be taken from this is, although everyone knew she'd lied, although everyone knew she was a horrible person, the problem was that they couldn't acknowledge any of this because it would make them look bad. None of the actual murders had been videotaped, which meant that there would always be a question of what happened and who had been responsible. Paul and Carla were telling completely different versions. According to Carla, Paul had killed both Leslie and Kristen when she had not been present by choking them with an electrical cord. On the contrary, Paul claimed Carla was the one who had killed them. He had never wanted anyone to die. He just wanted them to be there for his personal pleasure. Carla was jealous, resentful that he needed other women in his life, and she was the one who had wanted them out of the picture permanently, or else Paul would have just kept them, kept them both as long as he wanted, and then let them go, like he usually did with his other victims before he met Carla. Paul claimed that with Leslie, Carla had insisted she needed to die because her blindfold had slipped, but later when he reviewed the video, he realized that her blindfold had not moved. Additionally, when Carla was talking to the police, she'd basically admitted to telling Paul Kristen had to go. They couldn't leave her while they went to Easter dinner, and she'd seen and heard too much. Carla's story of how Leslie had died didn't make any sense. She said Paul had beat the girl brutally and then told Carla that they had to kill her. According to Carla, she was in the room when Paul strangled Leslie, but she turned away so she wouldn't have to see it. Due to the fact that Leslie had been dismembered, it was impossible to determine for sure a cause of death. They couldn't see ligature marks because a power saw had been used on her neck. However, they were able to conclude that none of the other indications of strangulation were present in Leslie's post-mortem exam, such as petechia of the eyes. Additionally, Leslie had not been beaten before she died. There was some bruising on her back where it appeared someone had knelt on her, but that was it. And remember, that Carla had claimed she'd been at work when Paul had dismembered the body and gotten rid of it the following Monday, but there was major problems with this allegation as well. According to Carla, Paul had used the power saw on Leslie in the basement, but a forensics team found no sign that a body had been dismembered in that basement, and that would have been a very messy task. Although there was blood and hair and fibers found down there, not one was from Leslie Mahaffey. Paul was not familiar enough with the human body and biology to accomplish this by himself, especially in the clean way that it was done. But Carla had been a part of many surgeries and autopsies due to her job at the animal clinic, and she had been known to tell her friends that there wasn't a big difference between the animal body and the human body when it came down to it. 
The defense team theorized that Carla and Paul had done this together on Sunday night. So they had dinner with the Hamolkas, and then when everyone went home, they made a tent of tarps around the power saw, and together they took Leslie apart piece by piece. Each piece was then washed, carefully wrapped in garbage bags, and brought to the cellar, once again, piece by piece. The only thing they believed she wasn't involved in was encasing the body parts in cement because only eight blacks had been found, but Carla had thought there would be 10, so she wasn't present when Paul doubled up body parts in two of the blacks. With Kristen French, there was also inconsistencies. Carla had not made the same allegations about Kristen being beaten, yet she had been severely. There was a lot of deep bruising around her face and mouth to the point where she'd actually breathed in her own blood. In Kristen's case as well, the pathologist could not confirm that her cause of death had been strangulation. Despite all of this, Walker happily told his client in June that she had been given blanket immunity in regards to Jane and all other things that she had conveniently forgotten about. So when Carla testified at Paul's trial, she'd been comfortably reassured that this had nothing to do with her. Nothing else was going to happen to her. It was about finding Paul guilty and getting him behind bars for the rest of his life. On June 25th, she took the stand. The jury had previously been informed that Carla Homoko was guilty of first-degree murder, but the prosecution had decided long ago to give her immunity in return for her testimony. This was to remind them that she was not the one on trial. We also won't get into specifics of the trial, but I do want to mention some important things. First, remember there'd been a psychological profile done of Carla while she was at the mental health facility by three different psychologists. These reports were looked at by Dr. Nathan Pollock, and he felt that they were all inaccurate. He said nobody should be using inkblot tests and things like that anyways. And he also said that they had scored the MMPI-2 incorrectly. The report from the facility said that Carla had a personality which made her feel socially inadequate, which prevented her from trusting others, and she'd often feel alienated. Someone with Carla's personality type may be confused, easily distracted, and are often diagnosed with schizophrenia. Now, Pollock rescored that MMPI2 profile, and he came up with a new result. Carla was not any of that. Carla was actually the type of person who loved attention and would report a wide variety of physical or mental symptoms for some kind of secondary gain. She also saw herself as conventional, moralistic, and the kind of person who does the right thing. She needed attention and affection, but her relationships were shallow and exploitive, with little concern for anyone but herself. She was drawn to people for what they could offer her. She used people. She would see herself as charismatic and socially adept. Others would see her as self-centered and narcissistic. People who shared this profile would often be diagnosed with OCD and or passive aggressive features. Additionally, her family described her as someone who was a leader, a bit bossy, a control freak. Carla fell firmly on the psychopath scale. He didn't think that Carla was depressed, withdrawn, or remorseful. She was immature, moody, and hostile, preoccupied with themes of violence and victimization. He did not believe that her anxiety and stress was caused by battered women's syndrome or PTSD. He felt these things were caused by her fear of being caught and punished for her crimes. Carla was on the stand for nine days, her testimony interspersed with clips from the horrendous videotapes. The families of Leslie and Kristen were forced to sit in the courtroom and listen to the last days of their daughters' lives, listening to their daughters being humiliated and violated over and over again. Carla was asked to describe for the jury and the court what exactly was happening in these recordings, because they only played the audio version in court. The jury saw audio and video, but in court they only played the audio. And she did so with no emotion and a completely matter-of-fact attitude. John Rosen grilled Carla about Leslie, how she'd claimed the girl had been beaten by Paul, but the only marks on Leslie were two circular bruises on her back, circles that were roughly the same size as Carla's knees. Rosen said to Carla, quote, What we do know is that these two little red marks are consistent with a pair of knees about the size of your knees, on that back, at the deepest layer, pushing the muscle against the ribs while you held her head down on a pillow and suffocated her. Isn't that right? He told Carla there was no evidence of strangulation. Rosen said he believed Paul had left the room to put gas in the car from a small gas can they kept in the house so that he could bring Leslie back to Burlington. And while he was gone, Carla suffocated Leslie. Rosen also didn't believe that Kristen French had been killed by Paul before they went to dinner on Sunday. He believed it had happened when Paul went to Swiss Chalet to get food for dinner. That Saturday night, it was an evidence that Carla had guarded Kristen with a rubber mallet while Paul was gone. And Rosen now had that mallet. 
Kristen had been tied up while Paul was gone, and they'd bound her head to the chair using an electrical cord around her neck. Rosen believed that Kristen had tried to escape while Paul was gone, trying to, you know, reach Carla's conscience, trying to appeal to Carla's humanity, which there was none of that to appeal to, so that didn't work. And due to Kristen struggling against her bonds while she was trying to get away, the marks had been made on her neck from the electrical cord but it had irritated Carla that she was trying to get away. So she beat her with that mallet on her face and head. And when Paul came back, Kristen was dead. The abrasions, the marks on Kristen's face were consistent with that rubber mallet. Specific bones that would usually be broken in the neck when someone was strangled were still intact on Kristen. Rosen brought up the fact that Kristen's autopsy report had not been signed for 14 months and had finally been signed nine days after Carla pled guilty in July of 93. When the doctor who had signed it was asked about this, he claimed he'd determined the cause of death right away, but he waited to sign off on it because media reports had suggested Kristen was kept alive in captivity for almost two weeks, and the police had not identified a suspect yet. Rosen wasn't buying that. He felt it had taken so long for the death certificate to be signed because they were waiting for Carla to sign her deal and go through her trial and be found guilty. Additionally, Rosen displayed a letter from Carla to Paul, which was written four days after Kristen's body was found. It said, You're the greatest husband in the world. All my love and sweet dreams of you and me together forever. She had also written to a friend saying that Paul had finally finished his album and they were going to have a baby. Rosen entered into evidence 100 and 77 notes and cards from Carla to Paul, most written after she had been forced to participate in the sexual assault and murder of three girls, allegedly. None of this really matters because Carla was not on trial, remember? They, they let the jury know she's not on trial. Don't, don't look over here, look over here. But what Rosen wanted to do was cast the shadow of a doubt on Paul's participation in the murders. There was obviously no doubt he'd sexually assaulted these girls, but the only evidence that he had killed them came from Carla Homoka, a known liar, some might say an unreliable source, and someone who had been his constant companion during and after. It was the only evidence they had that Paul had been responsible for the murders, Carla's word. In the end, it didn't make a difference to the jury whether Paul had killed Kristen, Leslie, and or Tammy. They couldn't pin it on Carla. And from what they saw of him, he wasn't a person they'd ever want walking free anyways. Even without the charges of murder though, Paul still would have been facing life in prison for the kidnapping and assault of these girls. But Paul wanted everyone to know, there were two monsters hiding under the bed of Kristen, Leslie, and Tammy. When Paul spoke on his own behalf in court, he said, people, I know that I've done some really terrible things. I know that. And I've caused a lot of sadness and sorrow in a lot of people. And I really feel sorry for that. And I know I deserve to be punished, but I didn't kill these girls. Paul said that Kristen and Leslie had died while they were alone with Carla. And he kept the tapes because he couldn't bring himself to throw them out. They were the last memory of their lives. I don't believe that. <laughs> you know, Carla Homoka's a liar. Paul Bernardo's a liar, too. I definitely don't believe he kept the tapes, you know, as some sort of um, monument to Kristen and Leslie and Tammy. He kept them as trophies so he could watch them and relive the events. In Canada, there's no death sentence. No matter what charges someone is found guilty of, the most they will be facing is life, which is what Paul got when he was held accountable for every single charge he was accused of. He would spend 23 out of 24 days in solitary confinement, and for many months, he remained in his cell for his rec hour. Um, the guards said they'd come to his cell to get him to bring him outside, and he said no, he just wanted to stay inside his cell he wouldn't be eligible for parole for 25 years. Carla went back to prison too, where she spent her days flipping through fashion magazines and reading true crime books. One of her favorite subjects to read about was the Morris murders, Ian Brady and Myra Hindley. I'd like to say that that surprises me or whoa, that's crazy, but nothing surprises me with Carla and Paul anymore. So where are they now? What has happened since these two individuals were put behind bars away from society? In 2018, after his 25 years in prison at the age of 54, Paul Bernardo made a bid for parole. According to him, prison had given him time to think and evaluate and receive treatment for his psychological problems. He said that his issues stemmed from low self-esteem, misguided coping mechanisms, cognitive distortions, and the disinhibitory effects of drugs and alcohol. 
blame it on the alcohol, I guess. Paul claimed that although he had empathy for his victims now, he hadn't when he committed the crimes. He thought that exerting control over others would help his self-esteem. According to him, he gained no enjoyment from what he did to those girls, but he did it to dull the pain he felt all the time. Once again, I don't believe this. I think that he did get enjoyment from what he did to the girls or he wouldn't have done it. For Paul, his inability to save Tammy Hamoka caused him so much guilt, his abhorrent behavior escalated after that. He was such a mess about it that he tried to take his own life twice. He said, quote, I failed the Hamokas, I failed Carla. Paul said his biggest problem was communication, which stemmed from his childhood when his tongue was fixed and he couldn't express himself. He said, this is why I offended in the first place. It was always hard to express what I was feeling. I always felt inadequate. It's so odd hearing somebody like Paul Bernardo say, my biggest problem is communication, because we know he has many bigger problems than communication. He also said, quote, at the time of my crimes, I was everything they said I was. I cry all the time. He told the parole board no one had a reason to fear him any longer. He was a different person and sex was no longer a big part of his life. He said, I'd like to emphasize I'm never reoffending again. I don't have the justifications. I've got rid of them through therapy and hard work. What I did was so terrible and I'll never reoffend again. Even after 25 years, he still held firm to his allegation that he did not kill those girls. He said, in the last 26 years, I've harmed nobody and being in prison is hard. I'm so nice. I'm so compassionate. I'm so caring. I'm not joking, guys. I know. I, it sounded like I was being sarcastic. That's legitimately what he said. It didn't take the board long, obviously, to deliberate before denying his parole, but they told him he could try again in two years. Some people believe he'll never be released, but there's some that believe as time passes, he will eventually get parole. And that's why, honestly, I made this series of videos, because... It's said that time heals all wounds, and the further we get away from his crimes, the lives he took, as the families of Leslie and Kristen get older and pass away, there's no more voices to speak out in outrage at the possibility that Paul Bernardo would ever be released. And when that happens, and there's no one left to say this is wrong, the chance of him being released increases. Watching these videos may have been hard for you, and it's supposed to be hard for you, for everyone. It was hard for me. We need to remember and relive so that someone like Paul Bernardo is never allowed to walk free whether or not he ever touches another person. It doesn't matter to me. His time in prison was not only to keep him away from other people, to keep other people safe from him, but his time in prison was his punishment, his life for the lives he took. And that's justified. That's fair. Now for Carla, and this is almost the most unbelievable and upsetting part of the whole story. She served her 12 years and she was released in 2005. She changed her name several times and basically dropped off the map. No one really knew where she was, but then an award-winning investigative journalist named Paula Todd decided to track her down. In 2007, Luca Magnata, a man who would later be convicted of murder, began spreading rumors that he was romantically involved with Carla Homolka. This was a lie, meant to garner attention for himself, but it kind of did bring her back to the forefront of the public's memory. Todd wrote a book called Finding Carla, which goes over her journey of tracking the notorious woman down. She had gotten reports that Carla was in the Caribbean teaching children roughly the same age as those that she'd helped kidnap and attack. Todd tracked her down to Guadalupe and was able to interview Carla. Now, if you're interested in hearing these interviews, I've linked it in the description box. It's incredibly interesting. I think there's three or four parts. I can't remember, but I definitely suggest checking it out. So what happened after Carla got released? How did she end up in Guadalupe? How did she end up with like all these different names? Well, when she got released, she changed her name legally to Carla Teal. And then in 2007, she moved to Guadalupe. There, she and her husband, a man named Thierry Bordelais, had three children together, two sons and a daughter, and she started going by the name Leanne Bordelais. Thierry is the brother of her lawyer, so he certainly knew everything about what she had done, everything. I was questioning that. I was like, did she marry a man? unbeknownst to him who she was, like he didn't know she was Carla Homoka. I figured that's the only way she could find someone to marry her, but no, her husband, um, her husband knew everything. In 2014, she and her family moved back to Canada and settled in a small town in Quebec where Carla began working at her children's school and volunteering for their field trips as if she was a regular soccer mom, as if she hadn't been partially responsible for the death of three innocent girls. She has a clean slate. She isn't even listed on any sex offender registry. 
Now there's a Facebook group called Watching Carla Homoko, which it's exactly what it sounds like right there watching her. Some people believe that this Facebook page has gone too far um, by taking pictures of Carla in like the doctor's office, posting her address publicly. Some believe Carla deserves it. I think Carla deserves it. The only problem that I have is that she has three children who are obviously innocent in all of this, probably have no idea who their mother was or is, what she did. So that's the problem I have. I wouldn't want something to happen to the kids. So I want to talk about Carla's husband, Thierry, again really quick. Um, it seems like he's just completely complicit or doesn't seem to care. Um, he was, you know, caught up with by a reporter and they, they asked him, like, how do you feel that the people who live in this neighborhood that you live in now, they have a problem with you being here? And he said, quote, if they are worried, all they have to do is move. We are free. We're in a free country. Has anything happened over the past 10 years? So why are they worried? I don't see why they're worried. It does make me wonder what type of person would marry Carla Homoka. And I will just say that. I won't I won't elaborate because I think this dude's a lawyer, but what type of person would would marry Carla Homoka and love her? What kind of person would love Carla Homoka? I mean, I feel like that's a valid and fair question to ask. Who would do that? And I mean the whole purpose of these videos at the end of the day is not to figure out who was to blame, who committed the murders, right? Because I strongly feel that Carla and Paul bear the weight of what happened equally. It doesn't matter who committed the actual murder because they were both there. They were both complicit. They worked together. But the actual question is, would either one of them have gone on to do what they did if they'd never met the other? This question was asked in the Moore's murders case as well as in the Juliet Hume and Pauline Parker case. We know that Paul assaulted women before he met Carla, but is that where it would have stayed had he never met her? Would he have just kept assaulting women until he was eventually caught? Would it have ever turned to murder if he hadn't met Carla and gotten encouragement and acceptance from her? Would Carla have ever gotten involved in anything dangerous and illegal had she not met Paul? She said herself that all the men she dated in the past had bored her, and she was looking for excitement, something out of the ordinary, which is exactly what she found in Paul Bernardo. He gave her the key, and she opened the door and pushed both of them through it. I'm also not the person who can say who killed Leslie and Kristen. I think it's pretty clear, though, that Carla was responsible for the death of her sister, Tammy. But as for Kristen and Leslie, no one will ever know besides Carla and Paul and apparently they're never gonna come to an agreement. However, I think it's pretty clear that Carla was not this unwilling, manipulated victim, and if you still think she is after all of this, and I haven't even, you know, covered everything, then I don't know. I don't know what to tell you. I personally don't even know whether I think if either of them would have gone on to murder anyone had they not met, but they did meet, and they did murder people, and neither one of them should have ever seen the light of day again. Paul, honestly, would have been found guilty, regardless of Carla's testimony, in my opinion. They didn't need her. But I do have to admit, as horrible as Paul Bernardo was, believe me, I'm no fan of Paul Bernardo. I don't feel bad for him. Carla, to me, is worse. A woman who victimizes other women, who took part in the rape of her own sister. As an older sister, an older sibling, it's our job to protect our younger siblings. But Carla didn't see it that way, and afterwards, she showed no remorse, no sadness for Tammy's death. At least Paul seemed thoroughly shaken up. He cried and screamed and smashed his own head while Carla ran around trying to cover up their involvement. Paul seemed genuinely emotionally kind of like pulled in, in two different directions. Even his ex-girlfriend Jennifer said that, you know, he was in the car when he was attacking her, hitting himself in the head and saying, why do I do this? Why do I do this? Carla is stone cold. Carla's got ice water running through her veins. So I guess what it comes down to, when you look at the background of Paul and Carla, it's kind of a nature versus nurture thing. Are serial killers, psychopaths, sociopaths, things like that, are they, are they born or are they made? I believe that they can be born, but the majority of the time they are made. And this is kind of a lesson, like, don't mess up your kids. If we look at Paul and his circumstances as a child, it's pretty clear to me that biology has nothing to do with that, right? Because Kenneth Bernardo was a, a sexual deviant and then Paul Bernardo turned into a sexual deviant, but they don't share any DNA. They don't have the same um, genetic makeup. Kenneth Bernardo assaulted his own children. He was a peeping Tom through the windows of neighborhood women. He had really abnormal sexual impulses. And then Paul Bernardo grows up to have similar impulses as Kenneth Bernardo, even though they're not related. It's what kids see. 
how they are treated when they're kids, how they see others treated when they're kids, and this has an incredibly big impact on who they turn out to be, what kind of personality they have, how they interact and treat other human beings. I believe he did feel inadequate because his parents always made him feel inadequate. He ran away when he was five and nobody even noticed he was gone. And the fact that he watched Kenneth Bernardo abuse both his mother and his little sister and basically treat women so poorly. On top of finding out that his mother lied to him and his girlfriend left him for his neighbor and his friend, that's gonna create a really negative view of women. But at the same time, I can't say that if, if nothing had happened and he had a completely normal childhood, that he would have turned into a completely normal young man. I can't say that for sure. That's kind of the problem. As far as Carla and all the reports that she had a completely normal childhood growing up, her family was average, everything. There's something weird going on in the Homoka family. I just gotta say, something is going on and I don't even think we know the half of it. The weird relationship between Dorothy and Carl Homoka. Carl Homoka's also in incredibly strange sexual proclivities, his, his high sex drive, which to the point where he's telling his wife's friends that he's in love with them, and then his wife's trying to convince the friend to have a threesome with them so that it can save their marriage. They're weird people. Once again, Carla's growing up seeing this, so who knows what kind of stuff her parents got into that we don't even know about, but she saw growing up. Maybe they were swingers. Maybe they brought other people into their relationship, into the house, and Carla saw this, so it wasn't strange when Paul asked her to do this. I'm just, I'm just speculating off the cuff here. But there was definitely a strange dynamic and Carla ran the roost at the Homoka home. She was in charge, she was Casey Anthony. She was in charge of her sisters, she would insult her father and demean him in front of her mother and her sisters. Nobody defended Carl, you know, he was just in this house of like mean-spirited, um, vicious women and he just got beat up verbally. No wonder he was trying to find someone else to love. But I still can't say what exactly it was for Carla that that made her a monster. And I do think that if anybody out of the two was born a monster or a psychopath, it was Carla Homoka. And the reason I say this is because you have to ask yourself the question. If you were in Carla's shoes, being the average, normal, uh, good-hearted person that you are, and you had taken part in the assault and murder of three girls, and you went to jail for 12 years, you know, you did your time, and then you got out, would you be able to go on with life as usual? Would you be able to go on with life as if nothing has happened the way that she is? Would you be able to um, get married, fall in love, start a family, give your children the emotional support that they need when technically something like that, experiencing something like that, seeing the things that she saw, taking part in what she took part in, it should have screwed her up completely. If she was a good person, if she had a conscience, if she had a soul, what she went through, what she experienced, would have screwed her up to the point where I feel like it would be very difficult to live with yourself after that. It would be pretty much like waking up every day and having to look at yourself in the mirror and hating what you see and reliving these things over and over and over again if you felt guilty, if you felt remorseful. The fact that she left prison, got married, had kids, she volunteers at her kid's school, she tries to act like everything's normal, her husband's agitated that people have a problem with her living in their neighborhood. It shows me that she doesn't feel bad, she doesn't feel remorse, she doesn't live with the deaths of Tammy and Kristen and Leslie every single day. She doesn't see their faces when she closes her eyes. She's completely fine. And to me, that's the most telling of signs that this woman is a psychopath. She's insane. She's dangerous. And she's out there living a completely normal life when Tammy, Leslie, and Kristen's lives were taken from them because Carla wanted her husband to think she was a cool girl and think he lucked out in getting to marry her. That's pretty much what it comes down to. Once again, I can't say whether Carla was alone when she killed uh, Leslie and Kristen, but I do believe she was there. And I'm kind of more inclined to believe Paul's story that that Carla killed those girls while he was gone. But that's just my opinion, and I am allowed to have that. I would like to know what your opinion is, an opinion that you're allowed to have, and I won't um, rake you over the coals for it. I just want to hear, I want to hear all these different opinions that you guys have. Do you think Carla 
killed Leslie and Kristen? Do you think Paul did or do you think they did it together? Now I just want to read a couple comments from um, part one of this video. And Melissa Clark said, We've lived in Scarborough our entire life. My mom went to high school with Paul in the Guild. In the yearbook, his class voted him ladies man. We grew up with this story. Very weird. Ugh, guys. I would really, um, Melissa, if you're watching, can you get a picture of that and send it to me? Because I would really like to see that. But that's gross. Ladies man. Ugh. And then someone else, Oli Morin Noel, wrote, fun fact, Carla Homoka now lives in my town. Oof. Sorry. Oli or Ali? It's probably Ali. Sorry, Ali. And then Brian Garcia wrote, the awful song lyrics, the constant videotaping, the perversion, holy crap, he's Canadian Steve Powell. It's so true. Thank you, Brian. You nailed it. A lot of you said um, he looked like Machine Gun Kelly, too. A lot of you said that Paul Bernardo looked like Jake Paul completely agree except you know the machine gun kelly thing like don't insult machine gun kelly like that angel warrior wrote looking forward to part two stephanie carla lived near me back then and recently i grew up in mississauga now i live in quebec her kids went to my kids elementary school a few years ago my community went in an uproar since we all found out it was unreal one day it was a rumor and the next day we went to school as usual and the news crews were there she never brought her kids back to our school again they sold their house and moved about 40 minutes away have no idea what has happened lately with her i have friends who met and talked to her during birthday parties said she seemed nice monsters are Around us in disguise. Completely true. There's nothing nice about that girl. Okay guys, thank you so much for being here. That's gonna be the end of this series. We are done with uh, Ken and Barbie Killers and I have started watching Tiger King last night with Adam so that will be the next video I'm going to do and I have a, a, a different kind of way I'm gonna approach it so I'm excited to to finish that up and get into it. I was just blown away last night when I was watching it. It was like it reminds me of one of those movies like um, Super Troopers or Anchorman or something where it looks like it's real, but at the same time, it's so completely unbelievable you feel like it's scripted. It's just bananas, this show. Remember to check the link in the description box if you want to check out the new spring merch and also maybe look into the older merch that we still have. Remember, that's going to be available um, from now on. It's not going to be limited, so you don't have to rush or feel pressure. Remember to check out the links in the description box if you're interested in checking out any of those additional sources. And if this series was your first experience with this channel and you like what you see, please hit that subscribe button because then you'll be notified every time we post new videos. Like the video if you liked it, dislike the video if you didn't. YouTube sees it as engagement either way, so it doesn't matter to me. Give me a comment. Let me know what you're thinking about this case. Let me know what other cases you would like to see. I'm working on getting a website together so that there's a place we can go that's centrally um, kind of available to everyone because I get case recommendations in email and Twitter and Instagram and it's just hard to organize them, especially because I'm an incredibly disorganized person. So this way, if I have a website, everything will be in one place and you guys can just go there and request cases or look at merch or find out what's going on or anything okay so that'll be exciting and that way if youtube ever just deletes my channel you guys know where to find me and we can all get together and figure something out thank you so much for being here stay kind stay beautiful stay safe and stay home and i will see you next time bye